Good afternoon. It's great to be uh, the first speaker after lunch. Um, all right. My name is Peter Sirota, and I'm the general manager of Amazon Elastic MapReduce service. Uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce is um, Apache Hadoop service that runs on top of AWS. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very proud of um, the businesses that um, our customers are building on top of um, AWS. And I want to talk to you about some of the big data processing uh, problems our customers are solving using Hadoop and uh, their innovative ideas around big data space. But before, I wanted to ask, you know, I want to talk about this question uh, that our customers are asking us about. You know, do we have enough, uh, what is big data, and do we have enough data to warrant big data processing technologies? So let's first take a look at several examples of data that can, um, off the, that can uh, you know, get big, and often does get big. So, first is computer-generated data. Um, computers typically generate data as a byproduct of interacting with people uh, or with other devices. Uh, the more interactions, uh, typically there is more data. And uh, this data comes in a variety of formats, from uh, semi-structured logs to unstructured binaries. And uh, this data is extremely valuable. It can be used to um, understand and track application or service behavior um, so that we can find errors uh, or suboptimal user experience in our applications. Um, we can mine that data for patterns uh, and uh, correlations to generate recommendations, for example. Um, so uh, if you look at, so for example, e-commerce sites, we can analyze user access data to provide product recommendations. Uh, social networking sites provide new friends recommendations. Dating sites provide qualified soulmates and so forth. So this data is extremely valuable. Um, Human-generated data is another example of this big data space. Uh, we have Twitter Firehose that generates uh, tens of millions of tweets per day and growing rapidly. Uh, there's explosive growth in uh, blogs, reviews, emails, pictures, etc. So um, that data can uh, can be mined for a lot of things. You can have sentiment analysis on that data for products or companies. You can have fact discoveries uh, done on that data. Social graphs like Facebook, LinkedIn, and contact uh, and just general contact us and email can provide. Uh, again, product recommendations based on the, on the uh, circle of your friends. So if you like something, it is very or if your friends like something, it's very likely that you might like that same thing. Obviously, you have features like uh, jobs you may like that LinkedIn provides. All that data is generated because you know LinkedIn has uh, a lot of data that they process and they understand. Uh, you know, they look at customers clicking at various different jobs descriptions, and that's how they know you might like that. Also, this data will enable you to do things like not never forget um, your friend's birthdays ever again, right? So Facebooks have reminders on that. So there's a lot of valuable information in human-generated data and social graphs. So all these examples is big data, and it's full of valuable unanswered questions. So why big data is hard and getting harder? Well, probably the most obvious reason is data volume. Uh, as data volume increases, it becomes increasingly difficult to process that data. It's relatively easy when the data fits in a single box, but complexity increases by orders of magnitude when we have to move from one box to two or multiple boxes. And so unconstrained data growth possesses a significant challenge in existing systems. The other reason is, complexi uh, is uh, the data structure. Uh, data comes in a variety of formats, um, such as log files, database schemas, images, and uh, with uh, internet growth, um, that structure, the structures of data are evolving and growing rapidly as well. So to analyze this data holistically, it is required to consolidate data across multiple data sources and multiple formats. Since valuable data comes from various different businesses, it's also important to be able to consolidate the data across those businesses. How can you get Salesforce data Merge it with Facebook data, merge it with LinkedIn data, and merge it with Twitter, fire, Twitter Firehose. If you can do all that, you can get an amazing insight about uh, your customers or, or your employees uh, or your products. So um, 
but all that data comes in various different structures, and uh, it's a challenge to uh, to merge those structures together. And the complexity of analysis increases because the demands on data are changing as well. Businesses require faster response time to, fa to fresher data. Um, sampling is not good enough. History is important. For example, in e-commerce, you can take a look at the purchase. Say a customer purchased something in February. Did that customer purchase something because he had a birthday or he had a friend who had a birthday or maybe that was a Valentine's Day? So you have to look at transactional level detail to understand uh, how we can help the customer figure out the right purchasing decision next February. So the history is really, really important for continuity of these decisions. There's also complexity of analysis. SQL is simply not enough to drive some of these answers. Data scientists require access to more complicated technologies, such as statistical packages, you know, the, the open source packages like R, or maybe uh, for sale packages like MATLAB or SPSS, etc. They want to have that in an integrated environment, so they have to export data back and forth. And finally, and most importantly, um, users demand inexpensive experimentation on top of the data. Oftentimes, we don't know what um, products or facts will come out of our data, and so we can't justify large upfront investment to just answer our question. So we need to be able to do that on the cheap. So we need tools built specifically for big data, because traditional technologies for dealing with, for, for dealing with big data simply don't scale uh, and um, the diver to the, the volume and the diversity of types. Once your data outgrows a single machine, you have a distributed data problem, and it's hard to solve distributed data problems. So um, we need tools that really are both easy to operate and cheap, which means that they have to be fault tolerant so they can run the commodity hardware. So uh, the first innovation that really sort of did a breakthrough in, in this big data space is Hadoop. Because Hadoop lowers the cost of development. It removes complexities of distributed computing. If you build your application in the right way with this map and reduced paradigm, you can then use that application to run on one machine and seamlessly scale that application to run on multiple machines. So you don't have to worry about the distributed part. They remove that, that complexity out of the picture. That's the most important innovation in Hadoop. So um, the key distinction between Hadoop uh, approach and that of database systems is that Hadoop doesn't require any structure on your data. Uh, you can just uh, upload files from anywhere, from mobile devices, from websites, and um, and the data you know doesn't have to be having a schema, and then you can scan that data using Hadoop. By the way, it also can have images. Um, it can have um, uh, various different formats, including database schemas as well. Hadoop will just sort of eat all kind of data format. And so, with the linear scale of Hadoop, the complexity of development stays the same as the data set grows. But there's another there's another challenge in uh, in big data, and that is operating the infrastructures that um, that host Hadoop. And so. That's where uh, the second innovation comes in, comes in and that's a, a cloud utility uh, computing. So as you probably know, in this, Amazon EC2 provides resizable compute capacity. Um, and so if you, um, you, you essentially can tell us how many machines you need and uh, we'll give it to you in the moment's notice. And then if you don't need those machines anymore, we'll shut down the, them for you and you're not charged for them. And so, um, Amazon EC2 lowers the cost of operating distributed system. And now, if you uh, combine Amazon EC2 with Hadoop, you get Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which is Hadoop hosted on EC2. So, in Amazon Elastic MapReduce, you get a fundamental shift in economics of data processing. Uh, Elastic MapReduce allows you to focus on developing your data application um, without having to worry about operating infrastructure. So no more system administrators, no more going and running to a system administrator asking, hey, can I install one more machine? Or if my application breaks for some reason, I don't have to go and contact the administrator to go and fix it for me. 
So it allows you to differ scaling decisions until the very last possible moment. If you're running on some set of machines and there's just not enough memory on those machines, shut down that cluster, launch another cluster with more memory. Uh, if you're running on smaller fleet, just add more nodes. So you don't have to optimize your machine, your application to fit in the stuff in the soft in the hardware you got. You you modify the hardware to fit the application need. And uh, and so this drives the experimentation costs down. If you have an idea, spun up a cluster, check out that idea. If the idea didn't work out, shut down the cluster. All you wasted maybe a couple hours, a few hours of a cluster compute time. So. We talked about the big data challenges and how Hadoop and cloud changes the economic of data processing. But what about um, our customers? What do they do with that technology today? So I wanted to talk about several applications that we have. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about them in a second. But I just wanted to show that list. It's a really you know, large list and it's growing. There's a lot of applications that Hadoop can solve. So obviously, the, you know, some of the... Um, most obvious ones, perhaps, are target advertising and clickstream analytics. There's a lot of log data you process. You probably hear about that a lot. There's a ton of applications in the security space that can be solved with Hadoop today. And it's solved uh, with uh, uh, Hadoop on our Elastic MapReduce platform. So antivirus, for example, where there's a tight feedback loop between what people are doing and what intruders are trying to do to break into the computers and uh, what kind of antivirus software you can get. So if you can harvest that continuously, process the data continuously, you can respond to those challenges a lot quicker. So fraud detection is another very uh, large use case in the credit card fraud, in the e-commerce fraud. So you close the loop between what processors are doing and uh, introducing the new models much faster with Hadoop. One of the, uh, maybe not as, uh, as well known, is image recognition. If you have security cameras, for example, you can actually find images in a, in, in a stream of uh, images uh, based on, uh, on an image that you have in hand. So uh, image scanning is a very large um, problem, and uh, Hadoop can help, uh, can help solve that problem. Uh, pattern matching, recommendations, data warehousing, bioinformatics, financial simulations, and file processing, web indexing, obviously, because Google was famous for creating MapReduce paradigm. Um, which uh, Hadoop was based on. So that list is growing, uh, and uh, we're sort of discovering more innovative ways that we didn't think about that uh, Hadoop uh, can be used for. But let's talk about some very specific concrete examples based on our customers. So let's take a look at uh, this example of Razorfish. Razorfish is an advertising agency, and uh, one big box retailer store came to Razorfish and said, hey, we have a problem. We have three and a half billion records, 71 million cookies, and 1.7 million targeted ads requests per day. And so we want to improve our um, return on ad spend. That was the problem. There's a lot of data that this retail business has about the users. They just never used it in advertising. For example, the retailer knows that the customer has purchased uh, a sport movie and is currently searching for a video game. So maybe it makes sense to advertise a sport video game for the customer. Traditionally, the transactional data about what you know customer has purchased in the physical store would never be used with uh, clickstream data. But if you combine those two data sources, you can create a very unique knowledge about the customer, especially if you go far in history. Because if the customer purchased that movie you know, two, three, four months ago, they might be still shopping for the very same thing. So, Razorfish has done a lot of experimentation. It's not that, the, you know, right at the front, they, they, figure, they figure out exactly the mixture of uh, the kind of data that they want. And so, they've, they've tried different data sets and for different periods, and the final design included a 100 node of uh, on-demand EMR cluster that was running the data processing data for uh, about 12 weeks, um, uncompressed, unfiltered data, 12 weeks raw customer data. What's interesting is, um, is that with move to Hadoop, the time to process the data to generate an advertising targeting model actually decreased from two days to only a few hours, uh, even though the data set has increased from about three weeks to about 12 weeks. And, um, and the time, that time decrease actually is really, uh, really good for consumers because they get more relevant ads quicker 
which is especially important during the holiday season. And so, moving to this new way of data processing and looking at the data sets holistically paid, paid handsomely for this big box retailer who got an increase of 500% increase on, uh, on um, ad spend. We can see from this example that data innovation can be directly linked to improvement of in revenue stream for a business. So let's take a look at another example. So Etsy, Etsy is the world's largest handmade marketplace. It's a place where you can go and buy, you know, handcrafted goods, you know, the tables and maybe or maybe uh, woven scarves and things like that. It's really really popular. Uh, they have 8.9 million items, a relatively large catalog, one billion page views per month, and uh, roughly 320 million. Uh, in GMS uh, in uh, 2010. And so Etsy is uh, an elastic map produced customer with the use cases ranging from customer analytics to advertising. So it's a really broad spectrum. So uh, here you can actually see a typical day of uh, Etsy operation. As you can see, the usage ranges from zero nodes in a day to 750 nodes in the course of the day. And you can see in that graph sort of the pattern of use. Etsy doesn't modify their data to fit a particular tool or particular ETL or particular cluster. They fit the cluster for the specific data processing application that they have. And so they don't have one data processing application. They process logs, they process uh, their transactional data, um, they process images. All those different applications require different cluster composition. And so they just modify their clusters. This flexibility uh, enables Etsy to experiment with their data because there's no resource constraint uh, of enclosed system. And if an engineer has an idea, she can spin up a Hadoop cluster and experiment at a moment's notice. And if you make it easy to experiment, engineers typically do just that. And so um, one result of such experimentation on the Etsy website is this test taste, which is a recommendation um, engine uh, that helps Etsy figure out your tastes and based on those tastes offer the relevant products. Uh, it works like this. You see six images uh, and you iterate through the, through the sets of six images picking up the, the, the most uh, relevant image to you, whatever image that you like. And if you don't like any of those images, you can skip the set and move to the next one. And after a few iteration, iterations, Etsy displays the product that are most relevant to you. Uh, I encourage you to try. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, and it does it does actually make an interactive process of of selection, and then once it learns about your taste, you really do get relevant products. Helps you because you know you you don't you don't have to sift through thousands and thousands of products or 8.9 million for that matter. And obviously helps Etsy because uh, you're likely to buy whatever you see. Another example of such innovation is gift ideas. A lot of us, I know myself included, are st struggling to pick up the right present for our friends. And so Etsy has made a product that makes it easier. So they look at the Facebook social graph that you have and learns about your interests and those of your friends. And then it uses this information to give you ideas for presents. So for example, if your friend uh, is an REM fan, uh, Etsy might suggest uh, a t-shirt with REM print, print on it. Um, so these innovative data products are just a few examples uh, that are possible if you lower the cost of uh, experimentation, if you lower that barrier. Those ideas weren't some product manager ideas coming up and conducting some surveys with customers. Those are ideas that are sort of homegrown engineering ideas that came um, sort of from grassroots and uh, they were possible because those engineers have access to capacity and cheap cost uh, of experimentation. Let's take a look at another company, Yelp. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Yelp. Um, as you can see, this company is growing rapidly and with more than uh, 50 million of monthly visitors and 18 million of reviews, the company generates about 400 gigabytes of data per day. That data needs to process and analyze and uh, uh, yeah, you can see it's about 12 uh, terabytes per month. So it's quite a uh, sizable chunk, but it's not petabytes. See, you don't have to have petabytes of data to use this technology. You know, a few gigs here and there is also really useful. So they frequently analyze this data to power key features on Yelp website. Let's take a look at some examples. Autocomplete search 
As you can see, as I, as uh, somebody typing the hotel Weston, uh, they immediately offer a bunch of recommendations um, on that, uh, that that are around the hotel. So that is a feature that is driven by Hadoop. Recommendations um, based on location, people reviews, or people searches. For example, people who viewed this viewed that. Uh, feature helps customer discover other relevant options in the area. Uh, people can discover uh, interesting facts about places with uh, people viewed this after searching for that feature. So in this example, you can probably see that uh, Western Hotel has a glass has glass elevators and is likely uh, the best location uh, in to stay in San Francisco, at least by some definition of the best location. There's also a review highlight feature where Yelp analyzes all the reviews about restaurants and summarizes the key features or key limitation of a restaurant without you having to sift through all those reviews. So they use semantic test analysis using Hadoop to generate those kinds of features. Another uh, example is a spelling correction. One might ask, uh, what does spelling correction have to do with big data analytics? Well, let's... Um, dig in into this, uh, let's take a look at how this, uh, this process works with the concrete example. By looking at million of misspelled words, Yelp uses an algorithm to create suggestions to common misspellings. It turns out, if you have, say, six months of data with misspellings, you have a lot of those, a lot of those misspellings, right? And so, you don't even have to have a sophisticated algorithm if you have that data. Um, and so, what, what um, Yelp does to address this particular problem, they, lo they load six months worth of data into S3, and then they spin up a 200 node cluster of virtualized servers in the cloud, and then all those 200 nodes automatically suck the data from S3, because Hadoop has a native integration with S3 file system, and in a few hours, it creates essentially a map of the misspelling words. And then they load that map into their application and so that there's a fast lookup. If you're misspelling something, they can um, display it. And so the result of that map is loaded back into S3 and then when the job is done, that cluster goes away. And so once the cluster is uh, powered down, obviously there's no cost for, uh, for, for Yelp um, of keeping that cluster up and running. What is interesting is that's just one of applications that Yelp is using. And so um, what is interesting is there's multiple applications that Yelp is using. So this is just one of them. There's a lot more. And so these applications typically require different cluster sizes, different types of nodes. Um, and uh, some of these applications require CPU uh, intensive nodes and some of the CPU intensive applications. Other uh, are I.O. bound and yet other require lots of memory. Yelp doesn't want to settle for the common denominator solution. Uh, and so they have single, uh, so they don't have uh, any physical uh, MapReduce clusters at all. Instead, they run 250 different clusters per week. This allows them to tune the Hadoop clusters to specific scenarios and um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, enable the developers to innovate at their own pace. So their production clusters are continuously running and doing things that, um, and, and running features and, and, and tuning the features continuously for things that are already public on the website. But there's also development clusters that people are experimenting with and cooking up new features. Um, there are a lot more many, there are a lot more examples of how Yelp leverages Elastic MapReduce, and they do it from you know anal uh, stats analysis for BI reporting. They're analyzing results from their feature experimentation, you know, the A/B testing, what is known as well as uh, they do consolidation of uh, duplicate business listings and you know more mundane tasks. Let's take a look at another company, Foursquare. Um, Foursquare is a, is a website where you can check in if you're at an interesting place and then your friends can uh, stalk you if, you know and uh, you know you can discover various different places where your friends are at if you want to stalk them. So it's a really exciting app. Um, uh, very interesting. So uh, it's it's very very popular. They have a global uh, global reach um, and uh, you know deployed across uh, all the continents. Um, there's a um, 
It's a native app on, across um, you know all of the uh, smartphone platforms. They have 10 million plus users, um, and uh, they have terabytes of log data. Let's take a look at their stack. I know it's kind of hard to read, but the idea is that they have transactional data, and then they have uh, events data. Transactional data is typically um, something where you know that, that you store in your database. Um, so there may be uh, customer accounts. That's a, you know well that's a, it's, it's a dimensional data. And then transactional data if the customer clicks on something, uh, and there's a log data that is generated across all of their websites as a byproduct of customer looking at any event um, or just browsing the pages. So all that data, transactional, dimensional, and event data, all the data goes into uh, S3. And so Elastic MapReduce runs on top of all the data set producing analytics dashboards for, to track customer behavior, but also various interesting features in the site. So for example, there's um, venue to venue similarity. How does Foursquare know that all those examples here, for example, are, are coffee shops? Um, well, they spin up a 40 node cluster and they submit Ruby streaming job and then essentially they create um, user to venue metric and they figure out the co-occurrences and they compute, compute similarities and then once that metric is completed, they shut down their cluster and they load that metrics into uh, the application server. So. They also can find out who is checking in. So that's their demographic and that's their age distribution. So that's interesting information for the product managers. Again, it's hard to figure out why that's important, um, but it sort of allows the data experimentation and then it's just may, potentially might allow uh, very different new features on the site. What are people are doing where? Again, it's really interesting to compare across uh, the, the continent here uh, in New York, um, you know, you have uh, a lot more bar check-ins than coffee shops, and in the Bay Area, that's inverted. In New York, you have a lot more public transit versus the Bay Area. So you, you see those kinds of similarities and differences. And then, where are the users from log files? You can find out this map. Oops, let's try it again. Can you see that? So that is essentially. Uh, the map of their users over time, so you can you can track sort of how your uh, how your website is growing, all based on uh, Hadoop jobs. When do you go to a specific place? Also, can be found through Elastic MapReduce jobs. You can see, for example, that some places here uh, are likely to be uh, sort of lunch spots for uh, folks at work, and others are probably dinner joints. So this green one is very likely a, a place for to have a good dinner. You can use analytics data to figure out why customers are using your service. In case of Foursquare, they're using it to explore the city, find friends, uh, save with local deals, etc. So you can see from the examples of Razorfish, Etsy, Yelp, and Foursquare uh, that Hadoop and Elastic MapReduce make it possible to increase revenue um, as well as to provide differentiating applications to delight the customers. In fact, Thousands of customers launched over a million of clusters in the last 12 months on Amazon Elastic MapReduce. It's a very, very vibrant place. We talked to a lot of our customers and some of them are really confused about the differences between MapReduce and RDBMS. They, they ask, are these competitive technologies? Uh, is Hadoop a replacement for traditional RDBMSs? Um, so the answer here is, they're not competitive technologies by any stretch. They're really complementary. Um, although some of the use cases might overlap, they're really designed to address fundamentally different questions. RDBMSs can really help if you know the questions uh, you want to ask ahead of time. So if you know the question, you can structure your data just right, you can create the database schemas, and you, and you can explore the key features of RDBMSs, which is a data placement, indexing to get the data answers fast. So RDBMSs can run in sub-seconds uh, or milliseconds. Hadoop doesn't have that speed. Hadoop is sort of this, you know, um, train versus a sports car. You know, if RDBMS is a sports car, Hadoop is sort of this train where, you know, it needs to gain momentum, but it can scan across a phenomenal amount of data set. So MapReduce can help answering late binding questions. So there's no schema. 
uh, uniform query performance that scales linearly for uh, reads and writes, variety of languages and tools available inside of Hadoop. Um, whereas RDBMS, again, fast query, only SQL, uh, and uh, rigid schema that is inflexible uh, if you want to grow, if you want to change, or if you want to uh, look at the data in its totality. So if you look at data warehousing architecture in AWS, it might look like this. Um, you see that the uh, there's three tiers there, and the tier one is essentially um, S3. S3 is a low-cost, bottomless storage with 11 nines durability where you can store all of your data. So you can store a megabyte of data or a petabyte of data or multiple petabytes of data. It has the exact same characteristic of storage and access of that data. So Elastic MapReduce has a native support for S3 file system which you can use to efficiently process the entire data set. So you can spin one cluster or multiple clusters against that same data set. So if you're having a production process that are running continuously in one cluster and then you want to experiment with the data in another cluster, you don't have to copy the data, you don't have to move it around, you just spin another cluster and point out to uh, that same data set. Also S3 has uh, elaborate um, you know, aqua model, so you can actually grant access to certain clusters, to certain kind of data, and not to other. So you have a rigid control about the data. So um, in addition to S3, obviously there's uh, the other file systems that uh, Elastic MapReduce support. And if you know Hadoop, essentially inside Hadoop there's this HDFS, which is Hadoop Distributed File System, which is also supported in EMR. So you have that file system as a cache to S3. So if you wanted to process continuously uh, the same data, maybe running multiple queries against the same data, you could pull that into HDFS and you essentially get the access to that data faster. And that's a tier two. And the third tier is you can push the data, once you process the data, you can push it to um, the RDBMSs. So in Amazon, we have uh, RDS, which is a relational data store, which supports MySQL and Oracle. So with Elastic MapReduce, you can use it as sort of this gigantic ETL that can push the data to your traditional RDBMS systems. And from there, you can access it really fast. So as you can see, the flexibility increases as you go from, as you go to tier one, but the latency is high. Latency is very really low in tier three, but the, uh, uh, but the flexibility goes, goes away. Um, and so, uh, you know, EMR, with EMR you can push it to RDS or you can push it to third party tools to create all app cubes uh, and use essentially the tools that you already have. So the idea is that each layer scales independently, that, which means you don't have to provision instances just to host your data. You have this flexibility as to what you host, what you process now versus what you just want to process maybe periodically and what you need to answer the data, uh, to answer your questions in the day to day uh, day-to-day -day, um, business. We can also take a look at another um, sort of slice of this, and, and this is some unique characteristics that you can have with, um, with Hadoop uh, and with Elastic MapReduce. So you can get elastic data warehouses. That's something that is really impossible to accomplish with traditional uh, RDBMSs. So rarely data warehouse loads are uniform during the day. If you go and ask any uh, of the database administrator, is your load continuously the same throughout the day, they probably say no. Typically, ETL loads happen during the night, which requires additional processing capacity. And then during the day, you only have a light load of uh, queries that, that are happening, you know, potentially um, uh, at a lower um, requirement for the cluster. So, um, but you also could have a perfect storm where maybe some customers require a lot of data uh, processing and so at that point the, the warehouse uh, need could spike. With Elastic MapReduce, it is possible to provision the, and to increase the size of the running data warehouse or running cluster or decrease that size to address that need of additional scale. So if you have an ETL at night, you can grow that uh, cluster and then once that ETL is completed, you can shrink that cluster. Those are the kind of unique advantages that you can have with the cluster running in um, in AWS and uh, with Elastic MapReduce. There's uh, another way you can reduce 
cost or optimize performance, however you want to put at it. Uh, so EMR has a concept of spot capacity where you would sell access capacity at cheaper prices. You heard it uh, from Werner and other folks during the day. So using spot capacity can further decrease the cost of processing. So you can decrease the cost of processing by uh, shrinking and expanding the warehouse, uh, but you can also decrease the cost of processing by using these spot instances. Let me take you through a really simple example. Imagine a scenario where you have four nodes cluster, and that takes you maybe 14 hours to process your app, to process your data. So the cost without spot is four instances times 14 hours, maybe 50 cents per per instance. That's 28 dollars. Now scenario number two, you can grow additional five nodes to that cluster on a spot market. So you run this four nodes on demand, but you expand it by five additional nodes on the spot. So because Hadoop scales linearly, your duration maybe drops from 14 hours to say seven hours. You can see that, you know, I didn't say it scales directly linearly because maybe there's some um, diminishing returns there in Hadoop uh, potentially. So with the cost with the spot, so you see four instance hours, uh, four instances for seven hours at 50 cents at $13. Five instances at seven hours, maybe half off because the spot is 8.75. And so the total is 21.75. So you can see that you, the time saving is 50% and the cost saving is 22%. So because we're an elastic cloud, we can innovate on multiple planes, on the uh, cost structure of our service, as well as on sort of the flexibility of increasing and decreasing the instance size. There are other EMR uh, spot use cases. You can run the entire cluster on spot you can um, have essentially, you can reduce uh, the cost of application testing if something that doesn't require um, production uh, level um, of SLA, you can run on spot those applications and, and, and recognize a lot of saving. In addition to that, you know, we're not, we're not there alone. We have a vibrant ecosystem around Elastic MapReduce and there are multiple tools you can use on top of uh, on top of Elastic MapReduce. Those tools that you already know how to use, because likely you, they're already in your data centers. Uh, we have BI suites like MicroStrategy. We have ETL tools like Pentaho. We have analytics tools like D Datamir and Karmasphere and Quest uh, software tools. And uh, there's a lot of open source uh, tools as well that are that are really gaining popularity. Obviously, Hadoop is Apache licensed open source tool, but there are a lot more of them. There are monitoring tools like Ganglia. There are analytics tools like uh, SQL SQL, uh, Squirrel SQL. There's also statistical packages like R are all available on uh, on us, and there's a lot more being built. So it's a very vibrant ecosystem. With that. Uh, I want to thank you for the, uh, it's the end of my presentation. So if you've been curious about Hadoop and MapReduce, but you weren't able to justify investing in a bunch of hardware just to see if it will work, I encourage you to give it a try with Elastic MapReduce. Um, so given the, the impact that this service already has on the technology, uh, you can't afford not to. So thank you very much.